This message is brought to you by DoNotAge.org, the longevity research organisation that's on a mission to extend health span for as many people as possible via products that actually work. Start your journey today at DoNotAge.org and use code LAMA for a 10% discount. That's L-L-A-M-A. We've been trying something different, live recordings of the podcast via Twitter Spaces, the audio-only platform where conversations can be held and are open to anyone who wants to join. This is our latest, a follow-up to our last episode about continuous glucose monitoring. We'll be doing more. If you follow me, I'm at Peter Bowes on Twitter. That's P-E-T-E-R-B-O-W-E-S. That's where I'll post ahead of time information about the next conversation, and that's where you go to join it live. OK, that's the promotion. Here now, a chance to listen to our latest live chat as it unfolded. Hello again. Welcome to Llama Live. Llama is Live Long and Master Aging, a podcast that focuses on the science and stories behind human longevity, purposeful aging and well-being. We're at LlamaPodcast.com. That's double L-A-M-A podcast.com. And of course, your podcasting platform of choice. This conversation is being recorded and will be published later as an episode of the podcast. So it'll be a 30 minute maximum conversation. We'll focus on just one subject, a specific subject that is relevant to healthy aging. And this one really is a follow up to last week's podcast, which featured Carly Hayes from NutriSense, which is a metabolic health company that uses the latest technology to help its clients optimize their well being through a better understanding of their bodies and specifically through continuous glucose monitoring. And I've been wearing a a sensor provided to me by NutriSense, wearing it for the past week, actually almost two weeks now, and downloading the real-time data to get a glimpse into my metabolic health. And we will talk about what I discovered. Carly from NutriSense is with us. And if you have a question or just a comment, please send me a request to speak. You can control your own microphone. Please keep it switched off if you're, you're not speaking. But otherwise, let's just dive into this subject. Carly, hello. Hello, Peter. I'm so excited to speak with you again. And likewise, yes, great to talk to you. I've had a really fascinating couple of weeks using this uh, sensor for real, which I hadn't had an opportunity to do when we spoke last. So it's given me some really valuable information. And uh, we'll, we'll talk about that in some detail. But I thought it might be useful if you could just give us a little bit of background and, and recap in terms of what a continuous glucose monitor is. Definitely. So um, just as a a recap of my background, so as you know, I am a registered dietitian. So I've always been in love with food and with science and with nutrition and being a dietitian that allows me to combine both of those passions, which is really interesting. Um, And I love what I do. So at NutriSense, what we're doing, we're kind of taking that a step further And we're using technology to let our bodies kind of determine what the optimal diet, what the optimal lifestyle plan is for us. I think a lot of times there's so many prescriptive diets that we hear. And a lot of times they can be contraindicatory for our body. And it's hard to know what's right for us within all of the noise that we hear day in and day out. I'm sure everyone's been told by their mom, their aunts, their doctor, uh, you name it, to follow a different diet. So we're trying to, again, cut through all of that and really determine what your body does best with. I think the best method for doing that is to use a continuous glucose monitor, which is what you're wearing right now. So I cannot wait to hear about your experience with the CGM. But really, when you look at metabolic health and understanding your body, Using a CGM is kind of the lowest hanging fruit to understand the nuances of your body and make those informed decisions by not only seeing all of that data, but seeing it in real time. So we know that behavior change is hard and a CGM allows you to see every single decision that you're making in real time. You know, you can see immediately, was this a good meal for my body? Did I respond well to this exercise or do I need to maybe adjust my fueling? So that's where I think CGMs are are the wearable of the future. And I hope that everyone gets the experience that you're getting at least once in their life. 
Yeah, it, it really is interesting. And maybe just to give a, a quick description of, of what it's like and what it involves. If, uh, well, certainly if you're familiar with uh, American currency, it is just larger than a quarter, I would say. And you simply pin it to your arm. And there's a little mechanism that comes in the box that you receive to help you do that. But it's like a, a very, very tiny pinprick. It, it doesn't really hurt at all. It, it it doesn't hurt. It's just a little prick and it's it's over in a split second just to get it in. I know some people are a little bit nervous about the idea, Carly, of just pinning anything to themselves that uh, otherwise they don't need to have. But uh, this is so simple, you, you don't even think about it. And once it's in, it's in. And you tend to forget about it. And I suppose one slight negative is that you tend to forget about it. And you do need to be careful, don't you, in terms of of getting dressed and maybe getting showered, washing yourself, that you don't knock it. And I think I have done that a few times. Oh, yeah. And there is nothing more frustrating than when you accidentally knock it, because like you mentioned, you just don't feel it. And that's yeah, a perk because it doesn't interfere with your exercise. It doesn't interfere with showering or any of the daily activities that you do, but also it can make it easy to knock off. It does have some pretty strong adhesive on the back of it. So it sticks to the back of your arm pretty well. But for active people, we just recommend an adhesive bandage over the top of that to provide a little extra protection. Yeah, exactly. So let me just dive into what I've noticed. And as you say, the data is real time, which is the most fascinating thing. You just point your phone at the sensor and immediately it retrieves, it downloads all of the data. And so here are a few of the things that I've noticed. And most specifically, you notice the impact of of food and different types of food. I would say within an hour of eating Any meal, breakfast, lunch, dinner or a snack, you noticed a a very direct impact on, on your glucose levels. And there are certain foods that clearly have a much bigger and faster impact. And the biggest surprise for me, maybe I shouldn't have been surprised knowing that there are lots of carbs in a bagel, but eating a bagel, my glucose level just leaps up. Not quite immediately, but certainly within an hour, there's a very significant effect there. I also notice, and this has been very significant, the impact of exercise. So I know we talked about this, and one reason why I've been experimenting with it, go for a walk, just a simple 10 minutes walk after your meal. Maybe do that one day, don't don't do it the next day, and compare what that does to your glucose levels post-eating. And again, it's, it's very significant. So go for a walk. And yes, your glucose still rises after the meal. It doesn't rise as, as dramatically. And then it seems to level level off. I, is that typical? Yes, yes. So I'm glad that you brought that up. And I think one important distinction just to bring up as we're talking about the increase in glucose is that's a normal thing, right? I think sometimes people put their CGM on and they're expecting a flat line in glucose. But really, that's that's not what we're going to see unless maybe you're a carnivore and that's working for you. A lot of foods, if you're eating a mixed macronutrient diet, will produce that small rise in glucose. But there's a lot of nuance there, right? We want to look at how high your glucose increased, so your total peak value. We want to look at the swing of that glucose. So did you start really low and then get really high and have that large swing? Or was it really moderate? And then lastly, how quickly are you coming back down? How quickly can you get back down to baseline values? And so we expect to see some fluctuation in glucose, but we kind of are looking at those three things and we have some parameters to kind of metric or monitor those. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. And you had mentioned a bagel. So this is a great example of carbohydrates, right? Those are the things that are going to have the biggest impact on our glucose. We're going to see the largest rise. To a lesser extent, protein does have an insulogenic response, but we're mainly looking at carbohydrate foods here. So when we think about carbohydrates, that you're, that's your starchy veggies, your fruits, your grains, dairy, and of course, anything with sugar or processed foods as well. And so one thing that I always like to think about is how quickly can your body break down that carbohydrate that you're eating? And that comes down to processing, Right. If we're eating a food in its natural state, our body's going to have to work really hard to bring glucose down and to process that food. And that's what we want. We want glucose or we want our body to work to break down that food. But when we're eating processed foods like a bagel, which nothing wrong with that in certain circumstances, if that works well for your glucose, but it's already processed, right? So our body has to work less to start to digest that 
and it can cause this larger swing in glucose and a larger spike. So a lot of times we see the more processing of food or particularly a carbohydrate has, the bigger the response. I don't know if you've seen that in your own data. Yes, I have. And and I guess uh, just talking about bagels, there is probably a reason why at the end of a marathon, one of the foods that they hand out is, is a bagel. And it, it, it certainly does the job of replenishing the glucose that you've clearly used up during 26.2 miles. But yes, you're right. I've noticed that those fluctuations in, in terms of my data. The other thing that I found interesting, and I'm, I'm very interested in sleep or getting more sleep and I've noticed that by, and I kind of knew this before, but this reinforces a lot. And I think this is why this kind of technology is is useful, that some of the things that we think we know, we can now back up through the data and by seeing this data real time. So by eating earlier, I noticed that my glucose levels, yes, they will rise. And I say early, that's about 6 p.m. and then stop eating in the evening. Glucose levels, yes, clearly rise after the meal, but then have time clearly to come down to a a level and and then pretty much stay at that level or slowly drop before I go to bed and while I'm asleep. And and we talked about this last time. And I think one of the reasons for not sleeping well or perhaps waking up in the middle of the night is that if you've eaten late, Carly, you, your body is still working to to process that food. Yes, exactly. I'm glad that you got to see that in your data because I think, you know, there's a lot of bioindividuality within glucose responses but the higher responses or the longer returns to baseline in the evening is kind of a universal trend that we see in almost everyone. And that is because as we talked last time, our insulin sensitivity or how well our insulin is responding to our meals, right? Um, How well our body's responding to that insulin is closely aligned with our circadian rhythm. So what that means is middle of the day, we're probably going to have our best responses, our most insulin sensitivity, and then middle of the evening or middle of the night, that's when it's going to be at its lowest. So the further we move those meals closer to that middle of the night, usually that means larger responses, so bigger spikes, even from foods that you typically do well with, but also it's going to take your body longer to get back to that baseline value. And then you add on top of it, you know, in the evening, we're typically more sedentary, right? We're not using our muscles to burn through that glucose. You think about a normal relaxing evening, maybe you're hanging out with your family, chilling in the living room, you're not really using your muscles. And when we think about glucose, that's that's a big sink for that glucose, right? Your muscles. So that's where you're kind of speaking on when you have that walk after your meals or any movement at all, you're allowing your muscles to kind of suck in that that glucose and utilize it to fuel your movement. So therefore, you see a slower uh, rise, you see a more moderate response based on the fact that you're using that glucose. And we can really leverage that to our advantage. I think that's a really interesting, useful, just a visual image as well, if you can just imagine your mind, all your muscles as as sponges, essentially, just to to soak up that glucose. And I think it also reinforces the the value of of good muscle strength as as we age. This is a podcast about longevity and aging well, and clearly maintaining good muscle strength is all important. Oh, definitely. And we see, you know, I think a lot of times we feel that if we get one hour of exercise in our day, we've done our job, we can cross that off the list, we're good to go. But really, we see a lot more success with small bouts of movements throughout the day, right? Not allowing your body to be sedentary for long periods, making sure you're breaking up periods of sitting to utilize those muscles, utilize that glucose, because that's just going to help keep your glucose more stable all throughout the day. While that, you know, exercise, that one hour of exercise is really important. We don't want to neglect the other, you know, 23 hours of the day. And I don't know if you've noticed this in your own data, but even just a single session of really intense aerobic exercise or like a strength training workout can help your insulin sensitivity So lower your glucose for up to 24 to 48 hours afterwards. So another rule of thumb that we always say for longevity, for glucose, is try not to go longer than two days without that, you know, big burst of exercise. Does not have to be a CrossFit workout, doesn't have to be, you know, something crazy, but getting that resistance training to help increase the muscle mass you have. And that's going to help increase the amount of glucose your body's able to store. Yeah, I have noticed that. I noticed a difference between like a session at the gym, lifting weights and a a long walk, the kind of long walk that I do every morning, a a very significant 
difference, which uh, if you're trying to plan your exercise over the course of a week and maybe working it around your meals, I think that's really valuable information. We're talking to Carly Hayes from NutriSense about continuous glucose monitoring. Uh, thank you for, for being there. I've got quite a few people listening to us now. If you'd like to ask a question, please do just send me a, a request to speak. And Stefan is... Uh, joining us from Love to Move. Uh, Stefan is the subject of our next episode. In fact, we're talking about exercise and movement in the episode I'm going to publish next week. Stefan, good to talk to you again. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. I, Carly, love hearing all the things that you're saying because so much of what I talk about is having frequent movement throughout the day. And um, I loved on, I encourage everybody to go and listen to the episode because something that Carly mentions is how different each person is. So in Peter's case, a bagel did indeed uh, shoot things up. And as Carly said, it depends on what we truly mean by shoot up, how depending on the slant of the curve. Um, But there was a wonderful TED talk. I cannot remember the study uh, exactly where they found that people were truly individuals. For some people, sugar was spiked with ice cream and for some it wasn't. For some it was brown rice, for some it was white rice. And truly finding that it's, it is an individual base. And I love that this is becoming more and more of hopefully maybe even a norm of monitoring glucose so that we can see what that's representing for our longevity and, and long-term health. Do you use this kind of technology in your daily life? And we'll continue this conversation in just a moment. Hey, quick question for you. Are you someone who wants to be fit, healthy, and happy? And what if I told you you could get your dream body by simply just listening to a podcast? I'm Josh. And I'm KG, and we're the hosts of the Fit, Healthy, and Happy podcast. Listen, we get it. Fitness isn't easy. Carbs, no carbs. Just stop, okay? It doesn't have to be that complicated. And that's why we made this podcast. We get straight to the facts so you can become your best you. So the way to check us out is click the link in the show notes or search Fit, Healthy, and Happy podcast on any of the major podcast platforms. We'll see you soon. I, I do not. Uh, I've been now researching it to try to see what I can get. It seems there are some um, used sensors that I could find on Amazon. Uh, but I believe that in the US, we do need a prescription. And I think that's something that Carly uh, touches on for uh, diabetes type one or two, um, as far as the US, but maybe that's a better question for her. Well, it, it is actually, and it's a perfect question. because It's something, Carly, that I, I wanted to raise with you that uh, it is a fact, isn't it, that here, at least in the United States, it is different around the world. But here in the US, a prescription from a doctor is required. Yes, unfortunately. And, you know, we hope to see that change over time as this technology becomes more of a household name, right? But for right now, you do need a prescription from a physician. uh, And they're normally only prescribed for people with type 2 diabetes or type 1 diabetes. And I, I do think it's really important for those individuals. But we know now that there's a use case for people that want to use it for preventative purposes, right? And I know we talked in our episode that an estimated 88% of, um, you know, the population is not uh, metabolically healthy. So I think there's the evidence there that this is useful. So if someone does want to get a CGM, you do need to go to your provider and get a prescription unless you go through a company that provides that prescription for you. And that's where companies like NutriSense come in, right? When you sign up for our program, you fill out a health questionnaire and then our team reviews it and you actually get a prescription from a provider on our team. So that's kind of how we get through that red tape and make it easier for you to access this information that we know is so valuable. And I think it's probably worth emphasizing that because it's something that I I hadn't realized that it it isn't necessarily a case of of going to your doctor, that there are ways and, and you've just explained it by going through your company. But individuals are still reviewed and and that that questionnaire is still reviewed. So it isn't automatic that you can just get one if you fancy using one. There is still a a process to go through. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And our team reviews that application just to to see if, you know, maybe you don't qualify. And right now that's anyone under 18 years of age, anyone that's pregnant. And that's just because it's not approved or it hasn't been studied extensively in those cases for our use. And then also anyone that actively has type uh, one or two diabetes that is using it to manage their insulin. So um, we have some CDEs on our team, but we're not all CDEs. So uh, we're not hoping to help manage insulin at this time. One other thing I wanted to ask you about, Carly, just an observation from looking at my data. One thing I noticed was that oftentimes early in the morning, and I'm thinking 4 to 6 a.m., just before I'm about to get up, I've noticed a little spike, not a huge spike, but a, a significant rising of my 
glucose level. I've been doing a bit of reading about this. I've been reading about something called the dawn phenomenon, essentially my body getting into that mode of, of readiness for the day. Is that normal? What's happening there? Yeah, actually, we see that a lot. And we always think of this as kind of your body's wake up cocktail. And this looks different for everyone. Uh, but in those early morning hours, this is usually between four to eight for some people. There's a lot of hormones that get released, right? So growth hormone, cortisol, and then other catecholamines. And they cause the liver to release sugar into the bloodstream to have that transient increase in glucose. So uh, this can be normal, right? It depends on the degree of the increase that you're seeing. But glucose should come back down within a few hours because your body's going to respond with that subsequent release in insulin. So uh, that's definitely something we see a lot. And yeah, it's, it seems like as soon as your feet hit the floor and you're up for the day, it starts to come back down. And just going back to the, the physicality of, of wearing the, the sensor on your arm and, and the fact that you, need, you do need to get used to it. It, it is easily knocked, and as, especially, as I say, when you're getting dressed. I think something else that I did was actually lie on it while I'm asleep. And maybe you can explain, but I think that the pressure on my arm in some way either knocked it or maybe internally did something to perhaps result in a, a less than accurate reading. Yes, definitely. And we we have a lot of people that will message us first thing in the morning. Hey, I had a glucose value of 20 overnight. Am I dying? I had that. I had exactly that. I, I knew I wasn't dying and I knew I wasn't to be too concerned because it was so low that it, it, you know, this clearly wasn't right. Yeah, yeah. So our first question is, okay, did you have any symptoms during that drop? Because if you had symptoms, that's another issue, right? If you had any symptoms of hypoglycemia, so a drop in your energy, you were awake during that time, you felt shaky, you were sweating, we're definitely looking at that first. But once we rule that out, we're going to ask, okay, were you sleeping on the sensor? And so there's certain arms that, uh, or like when I'm wearing my sensor, I try and sleep on my opposite arm, just because any pressure on that sensor can kind of affect the glucose concentration there and cause those blips in data. So a lot of times, if we see those drops, you weren't awake, we can kind of know that it was from pressure on the sensor. And in the next sensor, we can kind of mitigate this by different placing on the arm. And you say, interestingly, when you wear the sensor. So I'm assuming that as a, a, an otherwise very healthy person, and I think I'm in that category, because I, I think I was in range, time within range, which is which the the, the, the app tells you was almost a hundred percent on most days, which I think is is probably suggesting that I'm, I'm I'm reasonably healthy. But if you are a healthy person, is this something that you you don't necessarily need to wear all of the time? And perhaps you would recommend every every month or so, or every few months. Yeah, yeah. So for me, uh, periodic wearing is definitely the way that I do it. So every couple of months, maybe every other month, I'll apply a CGM just to kind of make sure I'm on top of it, try different uh, seasonal foods and kind of experiment with different things that are in my diet at that time. I would say for some people that have maybe a big goal in their life, maybe they're hoping to achieve a really big weight loss goal or their fasting glucose has been really high and they just can't figure out how to get that down, then maybe a more long-term consistent wear would be the best option. But for other people, you know, if you're just trying to make sure you're on track or do experiments or test out different diets, then maybe you don't need to wear it all the time. You know, one thing that we're always cautious about is, is this causing obsessive behaviors in the individual? And everyone's different, right? We're always trying to kind of vet for that in our application process uh, with the health questionnaire. But we don't want people to be get to get so hung up on this that they feel that they have to wear it all the time. So although we love working with people, I think the total amount of wear and whether that's consistent is going to vary from person to person. I think that's a fascinating thought. And there is a temptation to be quite compulsive about this. We all have mobile devices and most of us have favorite apps. And it's the first thing that we look at in the morning, whether it's the Aura Ring or for me in the last couple of weeks, it's been my glucose level. And I mean, clearly, there's a, a novelty to start with. And hopefully that's going to, to, to balance out. But I, I hear what you say that you, you can't become obsessed by these things. Yeah, yeah. And I, I always like to say that the first time you wear a CGM, it's going to be mostly insights, right? You're learning about your body. Um, you're discovering new things about how you process foods or have a bad night of sleep and it affects your metabolism, right? You're learning so much in a short period of time. But then usually that period is one to three months for most people. 
And then it kind of switches, right? Most of the time after that initial insight learning period, it becomes more of a motivator and accountability buddy. And I think for some people, again, when you have a big goal, that can be the best tool that you have. So wearing it consistently can keep those insights and that motivation accountability coming. But for other people, you might need that accountability once every other month. And then that's a good rhythm for you. Right. If anyone else would like to ask Carly a question, please give me a shout right now. We've got about four or five minutes left. In the meantime, uh, Stefan Zavlin from uh, Love to Move, uh, as mentioned already, Stefan will be my guest on the podcast next week. We recorded the episode a couple of weeks ago and we spent a lot of time talking about exercise and movement and defining what exercise is and and why it isn't necessarily something that you need to do all of the time when movement is perhaps just as good or perhaps even better during your daily regime. Stefan, maybe just give us a a quick preview of of that kind of philosophy. Sure. So I think that we get really um, just caught up on the idea that whenever I move, if I'm not sitting, if I'm not working, what they talk about is it has to be an exercise. It must be a squat. Uh, It must be a, a deadlift. And sure, these are movement patterns that we're used to, but picking something up from the floor is just as good as a deadlift in terms of your body breaking up prolonged sitting. So that's a lot of what I'm trying to combat is the long-term sitting. And uh, Carly even mentions uh, on her own episode that she talks about she will continue doing strength training. And yes, strength training exercises are important, but they are sort of a tool. And general movement throughout the day is really what we're trying to achieve. We're not really trying to exercise for exercise sake. We're trying to live a longer life, exactly what Lama is all about. Exactly. Yeah. Wondering if I could actually ask Carly uh, a question that I was interested. I did not uh, get to hear this on the podcast. Please do. We understand how glucose affects us. We know that glucose and water combine to make glycogen. And that's a perfect metaphor when you say muscles are the sinks. It's such a great, great term for it. Do you have any uh, data or ideas about how artificial sweeteners or maybe even things like stevia that aren't necessarily glucose based affect our uh, sugar levels? Yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, and I love your your analogy with the sink and the water. That's awesome. But yeah, I one thing that we always say with artificial sweeteners or sugar substitutes is that everyone responds differently. So I know everyone probably gets pretty tired of me saying that, but really it is the truth, right? It's all about personalized nutrition and how your body responds. Now with stevia in general, Uh, We know that stevia passes through the GI tract completely intact. So our uh, bacteria, you know, they snip some of that glucose to produce steviol, which is then transported to the liver, metabolized and excreted in that urine. So current research shows that there's really no accumulation of stevia in the body and that the energy from that glucose fermentation is negligible. So I would say from the vast majority of people that we've worked with, stevia seems to be, you know, a lower offender. It seems to be one of the ones that doesn't have that effect on glucose. And we can estimate that effect on insulin. There are others that can have larger responses. But I always tell people to experiment, right? Like maybe try a different type in your coffee every morning, if that's your your thing. And we can see how your body uniquely responds. Does that help, Stefan? Absolutely. Uh, that, that, that was definitely interesting for me. And I'm glad that you said to experiment because I know that some others cause insulin spikes, even though sugar might not go up, just depending on how our brain and body are wired and uh, habituated. So, And I know that you talk about a trial run of using the sensors or the monitors is a month because you really need to get a lot of data points. Yes, definitely. So a month would be two sensors, so 28 days of data. And I would say the first sensor, you're just figuring it out. You're learning to understand a glucose graph, which can be really, really nuanced. And that's where I come in or any of our dietitians that can kind of help you interpret that and point out those big trends in your data. But then the second one, you can have fun with, right? You can experiment and kind of see how that affects your body in comparison to your baseline that you learned in your first sensor. So. Interesting. Stefan, thank you for the question. We're going to wrap things up in a second. Carly, just in in closing, I'm curious, what is the next stage? What is the next step for this kind of technology? And uh, I'm I'm wondering really just in terms of, again, the physicality, are we talking about the the device, the sensor itself getting smaller and smaller? You know, that's a, a really good question. And I do think the sensor and the technology itself has come a long way. One thing that we see is, you know, with the progression of wearable CGMs, 
they start to monitor glucose for longer, right? So we might in the future see glucose monitors that monitor your glucose for a whole month without having to change your your monitor. I think that's an area that we could go. I know um, there's a lot of them that now you don't have to scan. So that's, you know, in the near future, we'll see that a lot where you just wear the device, it's on your phone, you don't need to scan and it's kind of through Bluetooth. So right now you have to scan your monitor every eight hours to capture everything. You can scan more often just to see that data however long you like, but um, you do have to scan. And for some people that are maybe doing, um, you know, multi-day hikes or maybe out doing things and, and not thinking about it, that can be a hindrance. So I think that's that's where it's going to go in the future, as well as um, just being even more available to more people. That eight-hour window, I've only missed it a couple of times, but it's, it's really frustrating because you get, you get a little gap on the graph, which, uh, you know, being a little obsessive about this at this stage is, uh, is frustrating. But you, still, you can still see the, the trend during the day, which I think is probably the most important. Oh, definitely. Yeah. And I think more people miss that eight-hour window during, you know, the overnight values when you're sleeping. Yeah. So I always tell people, okay, don't stress about it. Your night of sleep is going to help your glucose more than <laughs> seeing that data. But it can be frustrating, especially if you're a data nerd that wants to see everything. So that's where I see it improving and just becoming um, more nuanced and more accessible for everyone as we go. Carly, it is really interesting. All the best with your work. And thank you for your time today. Really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you so much, Peter. It's always a blast. And thank you all for your questions. I appreciate everyone that's here listening. Yes, me too. Thank you indeed to everyone listening. And just a reminder, this conversation has been recorded. We'll be publishing it later on, uh, hopefully later on today, maybe tomorrow morning. As a LABA podcast episode, you'll be able to hear it wherever you get your podcasts. I'll post a link to this Twitter feed and, of course, to the LABA website. Health optimization is what this podcast is all about, and that means taking care of our mitochondria, the energy centres of our cells. Physical strength, avoiding frailty, is key, and that's why the science behind urolithin A and the work of Timeline Nutrition is so interesting. You can find out more and get a discount code at our website and in the show notes for this episode.